Um, I'm really, really excited to do this webinar today with our education team. They happen to be the uh, one of the programs here at Sierra Club BC that interacts with the most number of people. We visit thousands of students and the program has been uh, running for over 20 years. And so uh, I'm grateful that all of you are here today. And uh, I will begin by introducing the uh, education program team. So first we're gonna have Kirsten Dallimore. Kirsten uh, grew up near the Niagara Escarpment in Southern Ontario. She worked as a park naturalist and a teacher in schools in Ontario and Quebec for over 10 years. She moved to BC six years ago to pursue her passion for environmental education, working with Sierra Club BC. She holds a degree in environmental studies, a bachelor of education degree, and a place-based certificate in ecological education. She is a certified teacher in Ontario and BC. Kirsten shares a love for taking students outside and supporting teachers through developing a relationship with nature through deep nature connection practices. And Kirsten enjoys spending uh, most of her time out on the water and exploring coastal rainforests. Kirsten, do you wanna say hello really quick? Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Uh, then we have Amira. Amira Madison was born and raised in East Vancouver. Uh, her love for the outdoors grew as a child throughout the summers when she and her family would hit the road for summer camping trips. Her close relationship with the local region fuels her passion of protecting our land and marine ecosystems through education. Uh, Amira attended the interdisciplinary degree program through Thompson Rivers University, where she focused on methods of evaluating experiential education programs. Her belief is that connecting youth to their local environment will begin to create the environmental stewards of tomorrow. Outside of Sierra Club work, she can be found building community through food security nonprofits, making art and gardening. Uh, do you want to say hi really quick, Amira? Hey, everyone. Wonderful. And then uh, our newest education team member, Telia. Telia Palmer Rubin is fortunate to have benefited uh, from experiential and nature-based learning environments while growing up. Her mission is to facilitate safe, inclusive, engaging spaces that connect young people with place. She is constantly learning and modifying her approach. Telia holds a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences with a focus on natural resource management from Quest University in Canada. She has worked in environmental education with a variety of organizations since she began working at the age of 16. When she's not working for Sierra Club BC, Tilia works as a bicycle mechanic, which is uh, where she's joining us from today. And she is a part-time environmental educator based in the Lower Mainland. Hi, Tilia. Hi, folks. Thank you all for being here. And then, of course, uh, we have Sierra, who is the Education Program Manager. Some of you have probably already seen her on one of our other webinars. Sierra Da Silva was fortunate to spend many hours outside growing up in Bermuda and then in the Cowichan Valley. She holds a BA in International Relations and a BED in Secondary Education. And after working in grassroots education programs in a nonprofit organization in Peru, and then nearly three years teaching in BC classrooms, she is excited to now work with children, youth, educators, and family, families to increase connections to nature and communities here at Sierra Club BC. Uh, welcome, uh, Sierra. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Kirsten to talk a bit about the background of the education programs. All right. So hi, everyone. Sierra Club education programs began 22 years ago. And since then, we've provided programs um, that are curriculum linked, outdoor based education and experiential programs to over 150,000 students and teachers in the province of BC. Our workshops are centered around um, diverse ecological and traditional knowledges of place, so place-based education. And they're facilitated currently by us three um, environmental educators who share passion for directly engaging with our local environment. The programs we deliver are in fact experiential programs they get kids excited about nature and spending time outdoors. We typically spend half of our programs inside. So that's about the first 45 minutes of our hour and a half programs. And then the second half of our programs are delivered outside, either on the school grounds 
or by visiting a local park that's close to their school. So for the indoor portion, we set up stations in the classroom for students to do some hands-on ex exploration of natural history items. We share stories and we also bring in sometimes some music into the classroom. Um, we also, when we go outside, we lead students through outdoor um, experiential activities like nature hunts and uh, activities that are linked to our programs. So we have um, fun activities like the webbing game that we um, do with students, the Who Am I, a food chain game, all linked to the actual topics of the program. So at the moment, our Going Well programs include our kindergarten nature and play program. We have a grade one to two program that's based on life cycles and ecosystems. We have our grade three to five program, which is a people and plants program. And then we have our middle school program for grades six to eight, which is called climate and place. In a typical year, we reach um, approximately 21 um, school districts and nearly 7,000 students. And how does this all work? Well, we, as you can see on our website here, we um, set up a program where teachers can um, let us know that they're interested in a program through email and invite us into their classroom. So by coming onto this website, they can request a program. We got an invite from them and we try to reach as many teachers as we can. Although there's always more requests than we can meet in a year. We also have such a great relationship with teachers and communities across the province and we certainly do get invited into classrooms um, year after year as well. So that's a little background information on the history and the current um, programs that we deliver here at uh, Sierra Club. Now I'm going to pass it over to Amira to share with you the benefits of connecting with nature. Hi everyone. Um, thanks Kirsten. So as we know, children benefit immensely from spending time outside. Um, I'm going to go through a few infographics. These were created by Children and Nature Network about the benefits of nature connection. So first off here, we can see that time in nature can help improve academic outcomes. This is a poster I like to arm teachers with when we offer our prode sessions for teachers. Um, for when they come up against criticism from parents or perhaps administration, when they plan to take students outside. So this shows us that spending time outside in nature enhances educational outcomes by improving children's focus, behaviors, love, love of learning, and might even boost academic performance. So to quote Richard Liu from his first book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, quote, time in nature is not just leisure time. It's an essential investment in our child's health and also, by the way, our own health, end quote. So spending time in nature, as we know, has a wide range of health benefits from increased vitamin D, increased physical activity and cardio fitness, and it's a great opportunity for socio, um, social emotional learning and well-being as well. Um, and lastly, and likely most per pertinent to our work here at Sierra Club BC, is that meaningful outdoor experiences inspire children to love and care for nature. So time in nature during childhood and role models who care for nature are the two biggest factors that contribute to environmental stewardship in adulthood. So for us in education here, um, if we can be that ro role model that ignites curiosity and passion within a child or student, to carry on stewardship practices into adulthood, we're better equipping the planet with eco-literate citizens willing to help steward it, both for uh, present and future generations. 
So if you're interested in having copies of these posters, we'd be happy to send them out following the webinar as well with the sources that they quote. So just maybe throw a, throw a message in the chat if you're interested in having those. And I'm gonna pass it on to Sierra, who's gonna chat about how we've adapted in the current times. Okay, so as we all know, with COVID, a lot of things have changed and it was uh, declared that schools would be suspending in-class programming following spring break. So by March 30th, we had already launched a Google Classroom page, which is something new for us, and also a new web page with resources that we would be creating as an ongoing thing uh, following spring break. So these are for both teachers and parents to help the children in their lives engage with nature. And um, it's just been um, really clear to us that spending time in nature, both for adults and children, has been especially calming at this time of COVID-19. And we're really trying to ensure that kids are getting away from screens and connecting with nature, um, nature being such a tranquil grounding source of uh, just a, an energy and a piece that we can all connect with and now more than ever. So this graphic here shows you the code for our Google Classroom. And there are some people who won't be able to join the Google, Google Classroom if their email address is not compatible with Google. So if that's the case, don't worry because all of the same resources are going up on our website. And we will share the link for that page with you in the follow-up email for the webinar. And uh, I'd just like to say that I'm really proud of the team because uh, our environmental educators have adapted so well from going from very hands-on face-to-face learning with students to being in front of computers producing resources. And uh, there are lots of unexpected things. We weren't really expecting schools to be going back on June 1st. So we're looking at how we can support teachers in this last month of the school year. Uh, with physical resources that they can use to take the students who do go to school outside even more than they normally would in June. And um, you can just let us know in the chat box what has worked well or what maybe hasn't worked so well and what resources you would like to see. And we'll also be offering an opportunity to share your opinions on something called Thought Exchange and the link for that will go out in the follow-up email for the webinar. So we're just trying to collect a lot of thoughts so that we can build better programs moving forward with uh, the, the constant changes due to COVID-19 that are pretty hard to predict. Um, but we're really excited that we're able to continue engaging children and youth across the province, especially now with more engagement from parents. So I'll pass it on to Amira and she's gonna introduce you to some of these brand new resources that we have been creating. Yeah, so first off here, we have an interactive salmon life cycle package that ties in well with the BC curriculum and our grade uh, one, two program called Life Cycles and Ecosystems that we offer in elementary schools. So for this program, it starts off with some information at the beginning about the spectacular feat to beat all the odds that is the salmon life cycle as well as some information about the importance of indigenous protected areas that are standing up for salmon spawning habitats. And then we dive into creating your own life cycle where students can print and color in the images you see here and match them with their description, but watch out, they're in random order. Um, the students would then glue the descriptions and their correct colored in salmon uh, to the life cycle map. Um, and it would create an interactive map showing descriptions and images of the salmon life cycle. And to follow up that package, we've included some questions that get students thinking about threats to salmon in BC and how that affo affects folks that really rely on salmon runs. There's also a coloring sheet and a word search in that package. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Telia, who's going to talk to us about our old growth package. Thanks, Amira. Uh, so our old growth package is aimed at grades six through eight with social studies, mathematics, and science curriculum in mind. 
The package shares history and challenges with old growth logging in BC and some actions that are being taken to protect these invaluable environments. Um, activities are aimed at getting students outdoors and connecting to place while considering time scales and human impacts on our natural world. So a couple activities that are included in this um, package are the tree age estimation activity. So that's asking students to go out, find a tree and use this tool to estimate how old it might be. Um, and then we also have a stand up for old growth poster making page um, that allows students to kind of get involved with um, activism in old growth protection and then as well as a page on salmon and old growth and that interconnected relationship to kind of connect old growth within a larger ecosystem there. And I'll pass it on to Kirsten to talk about the coastal temperate rainforest. All right, thanks Tilia. So we've also created a package on our local coastal temperate rainforest and this package is aimed at students in grades three to five although accessible for everyone. And this is where the students can explore what is the coastal temperate rainforest and where is it located here in BC and also where are coastal temperate rainforests located um, around the world. These activities are focused on a variety. This activity right here is focused on a variety of different living beings. And so this is the matching activity and this is where we can become familiar with the local um, species that live in the temperate rainforest. We also have an activity that's focused on biodiversity. So in this package, we've included the hunt for biodiversity as well as the um, a mapping activity for looking at different species that live in the rainforest and um, learning again more and diving deeper into more about what lives in this place and um, what, what is biodiversity, the variety of life. This is an activity called the lungs of the earth. And throughout all of our packages actually, and our, our topics that we've done, we've uh, focused a, also a lot on visualization. And if you can't get out into these places, this is a great activity to do inside your classroom or um, at your home. And the lens of the earth is about becoming the tree, becoming the big giant, um, cedar trees or fir trees out in the forest and taking in that oxygen, standing tall, being strong. Then we also have our um, activity where we focus on the roles of the producer, the consumer, the decomposer here, the forest recycling activity. And so that's just focused now on what are the roles that each of these living beings play within the forest and how are they all interconnected? And we have a fun poster making activity as well that's linked to the rainforest recycling um, learning. So all of um, this package on the coastal temperate rainforest is really about also protecting this place. Um, and so that's how we want to um, continue focusing on um, all of these living beings is how can we take care of them. So now I'm going to pass it over to Amira to talk about our signs of spring activity. Thanks Kirsten. So this sign of spring activity is the bird journal, one of our most recent packages to help explore birds of BC. This one's aimed for elementary school youth and this package was created in collaboration with and we're very grateful for the indigenous concepts thinking and images provided by Quetzanot, Charlie and George. Um, and throughout this document, you'll find references to many birds that are important to Lekwungen peoples, as well as the names of the birds in the Sanchothan language. And throughout this package, you'll find activities uh, for focusing on listening to birds, bird labeling activity that you can see here, a bird journaling template, and a checklist of birds that are common in BC, as well as a birding scavenger hunt and a drawing activity. And I'll pass it on to Kirsten to talk about our few videos we've produced. All right, so this was some, a fun activity that I uh, wanted to pursue is um, sharing with you some deep nature connection pro programming. And so 
here at Sierra Club, we believe that connecting with nature is the first step in protecting nature. So we created some videos and written instructions um, to begin um, with, with two deep nature connection practices that can be done simply in your own home. So this is um, a shot here of the sit spot activity. So we have a video that um, talks about how to do a sit spot, but we've also got written instructions also about going out into your community and connecting with nature each day. Um, there's some follow-up activities, so we'll see here on the next slide, a follow-up activity, activity where you can um, do a sit spot journal and record your observations and what did you see and what did you smell using all of your senses. And we also love to share with you that we've done um, the French translations as well. And so that's something that we continue to work on in all of our um, production of activities is sharing with you French resources. And then the other na deep nature connection practice that um, I wanted to share with you is the Owl Eyes activity. And the Owl Eyes activity supports you in expanding your peripheral vision and developing your keen sense of awareness. We've uh, created a booklet to accompany the Owl Eyes activity to help you also to record your observations for students to be able to go out and learn more about what owls also live here in British Columbia. So now I'm gonna pass it back over to Sierra to share more about what we've been up to. Okay, so speaking of owls, um, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in our drawing webinar last week. And thank you, Dr. Julius <laughs> uh, Chutani, who is the, I think you're on the call, um, and you were the wonderful expert so passionate about art and science and how we can bridge those together to protect beings like the Northern Spotted Owl that relies on important old, gro old growth ecosystems. And so if you missed the webinar, we do have that posted on our website and we'll share that in the follow-up email as well so that you can still learn how to draw the Northern Spotted Owl with a great technique that Julius uses to be able to capture a lot of cool shapes of the animal in flight. And um, I'm just going to highlight some other uh, programs that we have. So some of you might have already heard of this one, Seeing Through Watcher's Eyes Between the Worlds. And uh, this was launched a few months ago. And in this past year, since January, I've been offering Pro-D together with Kwasanat Charlene George, who was the creator of this beautiful mural. Um, it's housed at Spencer Middle School and it was a collaborative project with the school and with many nations on the southern part of Vancouver Island. So this online tool is based on the mural itself and um, we're offering in person and now online webinar style um, professional development to local teachers so that they are able to access this resource and become more facilitators of learning and seeing students as co-learners in engaging with this concept of crossing bridges to more fully understand Coast Salish and Indigenous worldviews and see the world through an Indigenous lens. So we're offering a physical treasure box of resources with printed panels of this as well as books and Pacific Northwest plant cards and more. And so those boxes are getting delivered this week to school district 61, 62, 63, as well as an additional box at Royal Roads University, which will be available for anyone who's working in an independent school, not connected with one of those three school districts. And so this tool is available for use on the Sierra Club website, and we'll share the link for that as well. Um, Another opportunity, which is brand new, um, and we're just about to accept applications starting uh, this week, is a summer program. And this is for students in grades 6 to 12. We're calling it Roots and Seeds, an Intergenerational Story Exchange. And it's taking place with this artist in residence, Alyssa Harms Weep who is working as a Futures Forward mentee with the International Center for Art for Social Change. 
And so the gist of the program is that it will be an opportunity for intergenerational and province-wide connections between youth and older adults, 50 plus. And the youth will be working on developing oral and written storytelling through creative nonfiction and through poetry and stewarding and instigating curiosity about plants and their stories and their connection to place. So we'll be accepting 15 program participants in grades 6 to 12 and they will be reaching out to an older adult that they're already acquainted with and exchange personal stories connected to plants and place. It's going to be a six-week program through July and August and it's going to culminate in a dynamic manuscript of tales and observations uh, about human relationships with people and plants and we're excited to see what Alyssa can do. She has a lot of experience working with youth and teaching writing and creativity and um, looking at how um, bridging literary performing arts can be combined with sustainability initiatives. So due to COVID-19, this will all be offered on a virtual platform and there will be more information on our website soon and going out tomorrow in our e-news. But we're very excited about that new program to engage more youth in particular beyond our grade eight program. And then just looking forward to September, um, we will continue to follow public health and safety regulations in terms of COVID-19. We are excited to get back to schools in whatever ways we can, but that will be dependent, of course, on those regulations. And as I mentioned before, we're going to be offering a thought exchange to collect your input into how we can continue to adapt and improve our programming to meet the needs of both teachers and parents. And uh, that will go out in the follow-up email. So we're going to be thinking more as well about barriers because we know that some people, for example, don't have a printer and haven't been able to engage with our resources to the extent that others have. So do let us know of any barriers that you have to accessing our resources or programming and we'll take that into account as we move forward. Um, we're gonna be moving on now to the Q&A period. So I'll let Elizabeth take that over. Thanks so much, Sierra and uh, Amira and Telia and Kirsten. Um, it's really amazing. I actually haven't had a chance to see in depth all of the resources that you've put so much work into. And uh, I'm seeing in the comments in the chat box that people are already using them and that they've found them useful. So great job, everybody. Uh, so if you haven't asked a question yet, there is a Q&A panel that's separate from the chat box. And that's what we're using to um, ask questions of the panelists. Uh, the first question that we have is from Bob Lilly, and he says, this is great information with all of the different activity packages. Very well done. How do you get this out into schools? Do these activities require someone from Sierra Club to administer them? I'm going to take that, so Sierra. We're in, contact, we're in contact with teachers, um, several thousand people who are signed up to our e-news, and people are welcome to use these resources, delivering them themselves with students. Um, we want people to be using these resources as, as much as possible. So no, we don't have to be there to help uh, facilitate these. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then his second question is uh, about whether or not we have any activities that are suitable for daycare aged kids. Uh, Kirsten, do you want to touch on some of the videos that you made and how that could work? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I definitely suggest um, checking out the sit spot video or the owl eyes video, everybody watching that and then heading out into nature to do those um, little activities. Of course, all of our, actually all of our activities, we have some great coloring sheets as well and uh, creating some artwork. So definitely um, I think you can adapt some of those um, nature based activities to the daycare students. For sure, you're looking to get them connected with some plants and animals in their local uh, neighborhood. Definitely um, check out the uh, yeah, check out the coloring sheets that we have. All that beautiful artwork that Amira did is wonderful for that. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee asking whether or not it would be possible to have some Nuchalneth language focus in the packages. And uh, so this is Gail. 
from the aquarium. So she says, at the aquarium, which is an education center, we're focusing on all parts of the environment as well as First Nations philosophies and language relating to the environment. Uh, so glad you offered this webinar and amazing packages. Uh, do you know if we have any connections with the, the new Chalmers that, that we would be able to adapt any of this? Um, so far, we are just, um, we have some resources with um, St. Chothan and we haven't yet started with New Chalneth, but it's definitely a possibility. And especially as we look forward to the coming, the coming school year, we'll, we'll be considering more of the diverse languages that are in BC. Um, there are many, so it's, it'll be a question of figuring out which ones we do first and uh, how we can do that respectfully and appropriately. Yeah, and maybe if I can just suggest, Gail, that if you have any connections that would help us accomplish that, that would be really appreciated. You know, anyone on this call, if you have connections that could potentially be a resource for us to um, expand the way that these are available to people across the province, we're always open to, you know, exploring those connections and figuring out ways that, that we can uh, do more and, uh, and make these more available. Amira, I saw you, you unmuted for a second. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say if um, anyone's looking for language resources, I'd highly recommend checking out uh, First Voices, the website. Uh, really great resources for learning different languages that are or have been spoken throughout British Columbia. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend checking that out, Gail, and see if I can help you in creating your resources for the aquarium. Great. Thank you, Amira. Um, the next question is about the Google Classroom. So how can home learners engage in the Google Classroom? Can you talk a little bit more about exactly how that works? Yep, so anyone who has a Google account or an account compatible with Google can sign up for the Google Classroom. And that can be kids as well as adults. So as it works now, you enter the code. Uh, we'll send that in the follow-up email. Um, you enter the code when you're logged into Google and that will give you access to the Google Classroom where we post resources and where anyone in the Google Classroom can then comment, ask questions, uh, post any relevant things in there for everyone else to see. And so it is open to homeschool learners. We'd love to see more kids participating in that and offering their feedback, their ideas, uh, also posting photos of what their finished work looked like. We'd love to see more photos of what things look like after they're done. Um, right now we're hearing from a lot of parents and educators, but we'd love to see more kids on there. Thanks, Sierra. Um, the next question is from Paul, who's asking about Sierra in Nova Scotia and uh, how we convince boards of education to fund meaningful outdoor and uh, environmental education programs. So I'll answer the first part, which is that uh, within Canada, there are two Sierra Clubs. There's Sierra Club BC, and then there's Sierra Club Canada. And so um, very similar to the United States where there is an entire Sierra Club California, and then there's also Sierra Club that covers the rest of uh, the United States. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's just more programming on the West Coast. Sierra Club was founded in 1892 in the United States on the West Coast. Um, and so the, you know, legacy and the programming is just a little bit different. So um, Sierra Club does not have a separate Nova Scotia. They do have a chapter that's part of Sierra Club Canada, and uh, they do have some employees that are based in Halifax. So um, Paul, if you want to send me an email at gifts, G-I-F-T-S, at sierraclub.bc.ca. I, I can try and uh, connect you with someone in Halifax there. Um, but maybe, Sierra, you can talk a little bit about the Pro-D and other uh, work that we do with the um, uh, education boards and uh, with teachers. Okay. Um, so one thing that I can uh, suggest that you do is ground this uh, make your case based on the benefits of spending time in nature, uh, such as the things listed in these posters. Um, there, I'm not sure exactly how it works in Nova Scotia, but in British Columbia, there's the Environmental Education Provincial Specialist Association, and that's comprised of teachers who advocate for environmental education and who teach that. So you could try connecting with a similar body like that in Nova Scotia of teachers who advocate for for this and it doesn't just have to be teachers who 
teach um, environmental education. It could be science teachers, it could be teachers from any subject. Um, we, we offer Pro D, we didn't, we didn't talk too much about the Pro D, but we're typically at about seven or eight different professional development conferences for teachers throughout the school year. And those are days when kids are not in session and we're offering workshops for teachers about the importance of having their students spend time outside and incorporating outdoor learning into their regular planning for what they're doing with students. So we've cultivated a lot of relationships with teachers over years and they become advocates in their own communities for having more outdoor education be incorporated into their particular schools and their districts. So our method has been about planting a lot of seeds across the province for having advocates of environmental education locally based. And uh, it's pretty amazing to see actually the enthusiasm from teachers and the leadership that teachers take in doing that, especially when they're armed with a lot of useful activities that they can do and facts about why it's important. And that's thanks to Kirsten and Amira who are offering a program we had called the Teacher Mentorship Program. Um, that concluded in uh, earlier this year in February, but that program was designed at looking at the specific school environments in which teachers were located, the library resources or school resources that they already had available at their school, and uh, looking at challenges that those teachers had, whether it was with administration or um, limitations of their class, their classroom, um, different strategies that would support their particular needs. Um, and then once they're able to engage more with their class in outdoor learning, they were able to convince other teachers to do the same and to unite with other grade level teachers who would be able to share in that as well. Um, Kirsten or Aaron, do you want to add anything about that? Can you just first, Sierra, repeat the name of the Environmental Teachers Association or whatever it was that you said? So the Environmental Educators or Environmental Education Provincial Specialist Association. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. And sorry, was there anything else that uh, one of the other educators wanted to add about working uh, to advance this, you know, in schools and school boards? Um, I know um, getting the uh, parent advisory committee can also have a lot of sway in um, elementary schools and high schools. Um, so I definitely suggest uh, finding a network of parents who are also like-minded can help persuade administration one way or another. That's great. And I see that uh, Bob echoed your uh, your sentiment there that the PACs really do have a lot of clout, especially in BC uh, elementary schools. Do we have um, any outreach efforts to present nature-based play concepts to the different uh, PACs? Is that something that we're doing? We're not currently doing that, um, but we did have, we occasionally have interest from school administrators who want us to be at school events where they know that the PAC will be present. And uh, so that is something that we could look more into doing. Great, thanks, Sierra. Uh, okay, the next question that we have is from Zara, who is asking um, if we are connected with any First Nation schools in BC or if it's mostly public schools. Uh, so we have, I would say, limited connections at this point with First Nation schools. Um, we actually, one of the things with the uh, teacher professional development for seeing through watchers eyes that will be connecting more with the tribal school uh, the Wasanic tribal school um, north of Victoria and um, we have well we had plans to visit some uh, First Nation schools up in northern BC in May but those plans changed due to COVID so that's something that we're still working on improving and uh, increasing our reach that's great. I'm wondering if we would have time, it looks like we do, for um, one of our educators to lead us through one of the, you know, uh, ideas that we've presented here today. Would either of you spontaneously feel uh, inspired to lead us in a, in a short activity that we could do here um, online together? 
Yeah, I could lead you through um, maybe Owl Eyes activity. That would be great. Really Thank you, to... Kirsten. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if everybody's ready, um, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to, I guess, I mean, because we're all in front of our computers, we're inside right now. But if you have access to a window or you have access to a picture or something on the wall, you're just going to um, get your eyes focused on one thing that is within, within your eye level and within your view. And so it might be, like I said, I have like a picture that's right in front of me right here. So I'm just gonna focus my eyes directly on that picture. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place my arms out in front of me like this. And you're just gonna keep your eyes focused on your fingers. And you're just gonna to start to wiggle them like this. And as you move your hands, you're gonna move them off to the side. And what you're doing actually, is you're just keeping your eyes focused on, well, in, in my case, it's the picture in front of me. And you're moving your arms off to the side and just seeing how far you can wiggle your fingers with your eyes still focused on your um, in direct view of your, like, your picture or whatever it is you're looking at, but you're still able to see your fingers wiggling off to the side. And you see the idea with this is that you're trying to um, expand your vision. You're trying to expand like your, your eyes and be able to have focus on one thing, but also keep track of other things that are happening all around you. How is this going with people? <laughs> this is great. It's really yeah. interesting. I have a hard time just keeping my eyes straightforward. Like I, I want to look yeah. down to see if that lets me be able to see more. <laughs> right. What you want to do is be able just to, to take your hands as far, as far off to the sides as you can, but still able to see your fingers wiggling. That's the, that's the key, right? And this activity is actually really used a lot when you're, like for practicing your spatial awareness because what happens is that when we go outside we we focus so much on just directly looking in front of us and we miss out on a lot of things like where are the birds what what, what what's happening up in those trees over there or what's even ha like what color was that flower that i just passed and the idea is just to continuously expand this vision this and, and develop that sense because each of our senses really needs to uh, just keep keep being um, yeah be, just keep being um, developed I guess you'd say and so th like I said when I said earlier about this being done like with adults or it could be done with little kids everybody can go outside and just sort of see what they can spot of course it's called owl eyes because the owl has like eyes the size of, well, in, in relationship to their head, the size of grapefruits, right? But their eyes are stuck in their head. They can't actually move them around. But boy, oh boy, can they um, definitely, their spatial awareness is huge because they can definitely see all the things that are, that are screwing past them on the ground and they can, they have a great sense of, uh, great, great sensory awareness. So I encourage everyone to give that a try. I, I definitely encourage you now to go and check out the video because I think I, uh, that'll be, make more sense, right? As to how this activity is really done. That's great though. Thank you so much for doing that spontaneously and for, for humoring me. I did find it really interesting that I, I can see quite a lot, especially when you're moving the fingers. Like you, you actually see further in your field of perception than I, I feel like I give myself a lot of credit, you know, especially because we're staring at screens all day long. So it, yeah. that, I really appreciated you leading us through that. Sierra, you unmuted yourself. Did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this activity is great to do on a daily basis along with the sit spot activity. So something to cultivate your perif peripheral vision over time. And then with the sit spot activity, um, that one's about really connecting and grounding into place and appreciating different seasonal changes that are going on in a, an environment. You can just pick a place close to home and connect with that one place and visit it over time. Uh, get a sense of what is going on in that environment um, on a daily basis or week, weekly basis and appreciate the many changes going on. So those activities are designed to be repeated often. That's great. I have a couple of other questions that were um, here. So 
We um, obviously we've been running this program for 20 plus years now, and um, it's typically done mostly during the school year. So are we, do we have plans for what's gonna happen this summer and then plans for what's gonna happen this fall that you could speak to, Sierra? So yes, typically we offer the program only from September until June. And uh, this summer, as I mentioned, we'll be offering the online creative writing program, but that is the first uh, thing in a while, at least that's being offered in the summer. Um, we have considered offering different things during the summer, but especially this year with COVID, um, we didn't go forward with any plans to offer more uh, more substantial summer programming. Uh, it is something that we would like to do, uh, but we would need to plan that and uh, and address, you know, what exactly would, uh, what we do and where it would be based. That's great. Um, and then we had a couple of questions here. Uh, Paul was asking if we had heard of the two-eyed seeing concept put forward by Drs. Albert and Mardana Marshall. Have you heard of that, Sierra? Yep, I think uh, Telia is nodding. Telia might have a bit more to say about that. Telia is calling in from her other job in the bike shop too, so <laughs> we'll give her a break for that today. But um, maybe, uh, Paul, you could send us a link and, and we can include it in the follow-up email for, for the other uh, teachers. Amira, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think my understanding of the two I'd seeing is just combining both Indigenous perspectives and Western views uh, in the education and as Sierra Club BC kind of goes through our transformation with our new strategic plan, I think that's definitely one of our big goals for education. Um, so we're ways we're trying to achieve that is by working with Quatsanat, Charlene George, um, and members of the community uh, from the Kongan territory where our offices are, are located um, and incorporating that information into our educational resources as well as what we bring in the classrooms when we're there, like reading stories um, from Strong Nations, one of the publishers in Nanaimo that creates amazing content. If you're a teacher and you're looking for authentic content to bring into the classroom, I highly recommend checking out Strong Nations. Great, thank you so much for that, Amira. Um, we have a question here about what kind of funding we receive to uh, run our programs. Do you want to answer that, Sierra? Looks like you might be muted still. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute there. Uh, yeah, so in terms of funding, uh, we receive some funding from BC Gaming, some from NSERC. Uh, we receive funding from the Greater Victoria Savings and Credit Union. Uh, science world, as well as various private foundations that support the type of education that we do, and some private donors as well. The school-based uh, donations also help. Um, so when people donate for a school workshop, that goes towards uh, making sure our programs can stay free and accessible for all. Uh, but we are really grateful to have many donors who support the vast majority of our programming. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Sierra. So I think we're coming close to the end of the hour. So um, do you have any uh, key messages that you want to leave the webinar participants with? Uh, yes, I would really appreciate any feedback. Um, it's hard for me to see all the chat bar and the feedback going on on here while I'm on here, but I'm looking forward to diving into feedback that you've given on this webinar and feedback that I hope you will give in the thought exchange. So with Thought Exchange, it's possible to vote on the thoughts that other people input, and that way we can gauge what is more popular in terms of ideas or what people would really support more, you know, some things more than others. Um, we're really looking forward to feedback during these changing times given COVID and, uh, you know, it's we're excited to be able to work with people and find solutions that work for their communities that work for particular teachers that we know are going to be engaging their students. And uh, it's a really neat time for us to connect more with parents, uh, more than we normally do, because normally we're in schools 
and we connect more with the teachers and staff at schools than parents. So we really encourage parents, grandparents, anyone involved with kids outside of school environments to let us know how things are going and how they've been able to incorporate things or how they would like to be able to incorporate things into their homeschooling or into after school time and doing activities with kids on weekends. And the more feedback you give, the better we can help incorporate a wide variety of views and uh, needs into our programs and make them more accessible for people across the province. Um, and then, I mean, we exist as this branch of Sierra Club, which is really rooted in connecting kids with nature and coming to love nature. Uh, so first knowing nature and then loving nature and being advocates for protecting it. And I mean, we know that a lot of you on this call probably already do that with, uh, with your students. So we'd like to thank you for doing that. Sorry about the noise here. I think they're just weed eating. Um, so maybe if someone wants you to just give a few thoughts on that, I'm going to close my window. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that, Sierra. This is the, uh, you know, challenges of uh, working from home like so many of us are doing right now. But uh, I want to thank all of the educators and uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I really do encourage you to participate in the thought exchange that we're going to send out in this, uh, you know, follow up email. And I encourage you to visit it more than once. So sometimes the first time you, you know, we go to answer the question about what's going to be useful for you. Uh, it might not, you might not have uh, all the ideas and you might want to come back and share another thought. And in the same way, as more people participate, there will be more thoughts that you can rate and maybe it'll spark new ideas. And so it really is meant to be an interactive forum for you to be able to share your ideas with other participants. Uh, and then, you know, help us understand what your needs are going forward. And uh, as always, we are always happy to offer all of our education programs for free. Um, we specifically try to focus on schools that are unable to contribute so that we can get in uh, to schools that might not have access to outdoor education and we want to be able to offer those for free. Likewise, all of our campaigns are funded by grants and by donations. And if you are able, we certainly do welcome you to become a member. Uh, you're welcome to join once. Uh, the uh, membership fee is just $15 annually to become a member of Sierra Club BC. Uh, but we do love it if you sign up for a monthly donation. And especially right now, as uh, we enter a period of financial insecurity, if you're able, um, we definitely do welcome and uh, rely on those donations. So do you have any other parting words, uh, Sierra, before we close the webinar today? Um, well, thank you for all that you do in engaging kids and in engaging people with using these resources. Um, I hope you caught what I was saying before about uh, giving feedback. And the more feedback you give, the more we're able to incorporate that into what we do and how we adapt for COVID and how we make our programs more accessible for everybody. And we look forward to that feedback and we look forward to more, um, more engagement <laughs> with, the, um, with the Google Classroom and having students uh, on the Google Classroom commenting. Um, I'd just like to say that if they weren't weed whacking, our pollinators would be a lot happier. They're chopping off all the dandelions and all the buttercups. Um, anyways, um, so continue just uh, following what we're doing and engaging with dialogues. And we're so appreciative for all the feedback we've received so far from people, which has helped to shape our programming just in the last uh, two months, uh, two and a half months since schools were closed temporarily. Um, we wish you all the best with the return to school for those who send their kids on June 1st. And we'll be thinking of you on Monday as uh, we know that that poses many challenges and worries for people. Um, we're in this together and we're really excited that we're able to be able to engage in dialogue and engage with people across this amazing uh, place that we call BC. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for all that you do in your home communities. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.